Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we appreciate our country's natural beauty and the people who help preserve it. In Washington, D.C., we see how urban beekeeping has the nation's capital buzzing. And in Colorado, we look at famed wildlife photographer John Fielder's work and the legacy he wants to leave behind. But first, we begin with a remarkable comeback story of an endangered species. The Mexican wolf is once hunted to near extinction until the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service stepped in to help save them. Chris Van Cleve tracks the efforts to nurture these amazing creatures in their natural habitat. It's an amazing race you haven't seen before to save an endangered species. Our cameras were there as five newborn Mexican wolf pups began a nearly 2,500 mile journey from captivity in New York to New Mexico and the wild. Veterinarian Susan Dix. We try and minimize as much as we can the time um, the wolf pup is away from a mother. The Mexican wolf, or lobo, was once plentiful in the southwest until it was hunted nearly to extinction. By the mid-1970s, there were just seven in existence. Now there are roughly 250 back in the wild. They are doing better and improving, but that's a fine line. Disease comes through, something happens, um, they could be lost. And with so few wild wolves, a lack of genetic diversity due to inbreeding <laughs> makes rehoming pups from captivity necessary. So this is a baby Mexican wolf. He's about 10 days old and very soon is going to meet his new mom in the wild. But to get there required hiking through miles of difficult and prickly terrain to reach the wolf den. The wild pups are pulled out, given a health screening and introduced to their new siblings. Brady McGee is the program coordinator. So we've got them all mixed together, all the puppies smelling the same and put them back in the den. Uh, when we walk away from it, uh, the mom will come back. It would seem like to me that if you just sort of increased the size of a litter that the wolf would notice. You know, we don't think they can count, but they will care for pups, whether or not they're theirs. Another threat to their survival is mistaken identity. Young wolves look a lot like coyotes, which can be legally hunted in Arizona and New Mexico. Conservationists estimate about 30 wolves a year are killed by humans. What we're disappointed by is that the agency hasn't taken the threat more seriously and taken more steps to mitigate that impact. They pushed the Wildlife Service to use the Endangered Species Act to ban hunting of coyotes in wolf country, something the government declined to do. What we want to do is, is increase education, get, get out the differences more. Protecting those animals wouldn't result in a net benefit for wolves because probably the public would be darn irritated with it. Not everyone is excited about the Mexican wolves' return. While their dens are on Forest Service land, some of that land is also leased by ranchers and the wolves can target their cattle. Is this wolf country? Yes, it is. Calfing season now comes with concern for Barbara Marks. Her family's been ranching this land along Arizona's Blue River since 1891. Wolves were a threat then, and she says they're targeting her calves again now. The numbers have increased dramatically, so they have become more of an issue and more of a year-round issue. Wildlife officials estimate about 100 cattle a year are lost to Mexican wolves, and ranchers are reimbursed. Marx believes the actual number is likely higher, but also knows her new neighbors are here to stay. They're here, so we have to deal with them. Why is it important to save the wolves? It's a keystone species, so everything that happens at the top of the food chain trickles down and helps down um, below and um, helps keep the environment more natural. Ranchers and wild wolves learning to coexist once again. From forest to flowers, a historic factory is home to a long abandoned garden, now undergoing a surprising restoration. Jim Axelrod travels to Delaware to witness the simple beauty of embracing Mother Nature. So, original storage tunnel. If you like a reclamation project, you'll love what Paul Orpello is overseeing at the Hagley Museum in Delaware. There's no other post-industrial site reimagined in this way. There's only one in Delaware, only one on the eastern seaboard. There's only one in the world. The site of the original DuPont factory, 
where a great American fortune was made in gunpowder in the 19th century, and where a DuPont heiress named Louise Crowninshield turned all that destruction into a garden. So in the prime of her life, what did this place look like? It looked like you were walking through an Italian villa with English-style plantings adorning it. But then she died in 1958. Everything that she worked to preserve, this somehow got lost to time. Which is where Orpello comes in. Hired in 2018 to reclaim Louise's garden, the pandemic hit before he could get going, which is when he found out he didn't exactly need to. So you're walking around out here, you're seeing flowers that haven't bloomed in half a century. What is washing over you? So much emotion at, at certain points, just falling down on my knees, um, trying to understand. As the world shut down in the spring of 2020, flowers dormant for decades here started to bloom. Azaleas, tulips, peonies. What sense did you make of it? I don't know that I could or that I, I still can't, um, just that it's magic. Now, Paul wants to fully restore the garden to how Louise had it, with pools she set in factory building footprints and a mosaic terrace recently discovered under the dirt. There was about a foot of compost from everything growing and dying, and then that was gently broomed off. A couple of rains later, Pegasus showed up. Paul Orpello figures it will cost about $30 million to finish the job. But he's not focused on the money. He's focused on the message. It's such a great story of resiliency, and this whole entire hillside erupted back into life when the world had shut down. A message of magic he needed then, and we all still need now. Coming up, Washington is a buzz over a program helping honeybees survive and thrive. This is Eye on America. The hardest workers in Washington won't be found inside government buildings, but on their rooftops. Christina Raffini shows us how efforts to conserve honeybees have yielded sweet results. In these unassuming boxes, on a secure compound near the U.S. State Department, government drones are hard at work. All this is honey. We have honey. This is all honey. Team-oriented, mission-focused bureaucrats. It's pretty heavy. It's heavy. Oh, it's really heavy. They might be the perfect federal workers. Uh, we try to keep them apolitical. Keith Hannigan is the State Department's Deputy Assistant Secretary in charge of operations, and also bees. Bees is really one of the most important things that I do here for the State Department. About 15 years ago, honeybee populations hit an all-time low. So in 2014, then-President Obama launched a national strategy to protect and promote pollinators. Oh, no, it's a bee. It's okay, guys. Bees are good. From the White House to a federal courthouse, even the State Department, hives started humming at government facilities across the country. We wanted to do our part, and we know that other agencies were getting involved as well. So um, it seemed like something small and simple that we could do. Thanks to the diligent effort of beekeepers, over the past few years, the honeybee population has largely rebounded and stabilized. But pesticides, mites, and habitat loss still pose a threat. Now you see them and you want to nurture them, you want to take care of them. So I think it's really raised the awareness, certainly for me, but I think for a lot of our staff. The swarm. That's because historically, bees haven't gotten very good buzz. Whatever you do, do not panic. Better known for ruining backlot picnics, and causing the fictional anaphylactic death of a young Macaulay Culkin. But in actuality, bees and other pollinators are critical to the global food supply, pollinating about a third of the world's crops and three-fourths of all flowering plants. They're not going to be interested in you or your food. They're not going to be like, oh, there's a human, let's go sting them. Solomon Jong is an urban beekeeper in Washington, D.C. Look at all that honey right there. That's awesome. Yeah. 
just flap their he wings. He says off. education efforts, especially in highly populated areas, thanks for coming out to meet the bees, are successfully winning over hearts and minds. A lot more people are more aware of like how important they are, as well as like how cute they are. Like honestly, they're like, cute. Yeah, they're very cute for me. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> okay, I'll come with you. Like, but explain to me what about the bees. I mean, if you see a photo, they're fuzzy and round. It's almost like a teddy bear or something. Their cuteness might be up for debate, but the sweet rewards of beekeeping are undeniable. Oh, yeah, you can dip your finger straight into that corner there and take a little bit out. Just dip right here? Yep. Oh, my gosh. Yep, yeah. and then right out. Right out. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> oh, my gosh, it's really good, actually. On the rooftop of the Canadian Embassy, within sight of the nation's capital, Queen's Beyoncé and Celine Beyon are living their best life. How many bees are in each bee box? Between 25 and 30,000 bees in this whole hive. Sean Robertson manages this facility for the Canadian government. He says these little goodwill ambassadors churn out about 100 jars of honey a year. I often say it's one of my favorite parts of my job is actually coming up here and uh, getting to work with the bees. Befitting the Canadian national stereotype, the bees were surprisingly friendly, which was good, considering the crew's unbothered take on donning protective gear. So you're going to give me two finger guns? I'm going to just rest it on your fingers. Okay. Beauty. Hi. So that's a, that's a frame of bees, right? It's, um, it's a lot of bees. As it turns out, a lot of bees is a very good thing. Continuing in our nation's capital, we look at the surprising threat facing another winged creature, birds. Nicole Killian looks at the dangers glass structures pose and learns about measures we can take to keep our avian friends safe. On any given morning, Lizbeth Fuse walks the streets of the nation's capital. It's become a kind of personal mission. That mission, as a volunteer citizen scientist with the group Lights Out DC, is to find birds. Yeah, it's a really growing movement nationwide. But this bird watching expedition is not what you might expect. In most cases, Lisbeth and her team are not looking to the sky. There's a bird. But to the ground, collecting dead fowl after they've collided with buildings. This is a huge problem. They estimate that over but somewhere between 300 and 1 billion birds a year die in the United States from window collisions. And these are migratory birds. So we are interested in documenting this problem so that um, people become aware of the issue. It's an issue that motivated the redesign of the birdhouse at the National Zoo, which features dozens of species native to North America. It's one of the first in the country to create a structure that's completely bird friendly. What makes it bird friendly? What makes it bird friendly is you can see the two inch horizontal stripes. And so birds perceive that as something they can't fly through. Sarah Halliger is a curator for the exhibit. Most birds are hitting glass because they see some sort of reflection and they think that's a tree in the glass. And so they want to fly to that tree. They're usually flying at very high speeds. And so then they hit the glass and it's either a lethal strike or uh, they're injured. Halliger says about half of those collisions occur in homes and are easily avoidable. But put some little paint or, or get your kids involved and paint this window. Um, you just want to stop birds from hitting. Anything that reduces the reflection will stop birds from hitting glass. So That's putting a part. dot like this is, reduces the reflection. As long as it's appropriately spaced. Nearly two dozen cities and states have adopted bird safe measures such as requiring buildings to use bird friendly glass or reduce artificial lighting. Efforts welcomed by Lisbeth. We're part of this problem and we can be part of the solution. Solutions taking flight to keep nature's aviators soaring. Ahead, a photographer with an extraordinary eye for nature. That story's next. We close our show from the picturesque Rocky Mountains, admiring the view of a life well lived. Nature photographer John Fielder reflects on his vast photo collection, a staggering 200,000 pictures as he faces terminal pancreatic cancer. Barry Peterson brings us a snapshot of his lifelong mission to protect the great outdoors. The Majesty of Mountains the whisper of winter. 
The Rebirth of Spring, captured by John Fielder's eyes and cameras. I first met John in 2015 at Rocky Mountain National Park for a story on CBS Sunday Morning. Do you still come to a place like this and just take a deep breath and be a little bit in awe of all of this? I never get tired of being in places like this. It's my medicine. I've been to the park a hundred times in the last 40 years, and uh, it gets better, actually, each time that I come here. Years capturing Colorado in the wild. 40 years ago, all I wanted to do was one thing, and that is quit my department store job, cold turkey, and with a wife, a child, and another one on the way, turn my passion, my hobby, photography, into a new career. And I pulled that off. Sharing the wilderness with elk, and foxes, and one big ornery goat. And then when I was about 18 inches away, the goat right here, he stood up on all fours as if he was gonna butt me with his rack. And uh, I, again, just kind of calmly backed up and stood still. And the goat went back down on all fours and just stared at me. A goat who later pretty much posed right in front of his camera. It culminated a day later in me actually communicating with the goat, with my hand on my head laying down next to this goat 80 to 18 inches away and asking the goat questions like, what's it like to be in the wilderness 24 seven? What are girl goats like? And the funny thing is I never got one answer, but he seemed to be enjoying the conversation. The sound of your voice. I think my voice was euphonic for whatever reason and it calmed him when I was next to him. His pictures drew thousands to the wilderness who sometimes damaged his beloved nature. But now he believes they will also help nature survive. If you don't smell it, the smell of decaying aspen leaves in the fall, taste it, the taste of that cold, metallic, freshly melted snow water up high at 12,000 feet, if you don't listen to the um, hummingbirds in the meadow at 11,000 feet, you never really develop an appreciation for the sensuousness of nature and the fact that this is a 4.3 billion year process of evolution. And in our American democracy, that's why we protected more wilderness than any other country on the planet. And I want people to vote that way. And unless they care, they won't do it. This is his memory lane, calling 200,000 negatives down to 7,000 of the best. Good memories when you went through them? Yes, this was my life happening all over again for the second time going through 2,000, 200,000 transparencies. Hikes remembered, climbs remembered, you know, screw ups remembered, um, things coming at you remembered. It's all, it's all there. It was all very humbling. Now he faces a greater challenge than any four by five inch he faced in nature. I want to talk a minute about your cancer. John has terminal pancreatic cancer. You have probably seen as much as any man of nature. Birth, life, death. I sometimes have the sense talking with you, John, that it informs the way that you are approaching death. It's part of life. Help me understand this. My mind always tends to think scientifically, you know, um, logically and deductively and analytically you know, trying to understand what's going on around me. Living in the moment sounds like a cliche, but living in the moment, living in the present is medicine for me. And it allows me to appreciate the past and the future, but by always being focused on what I've been given today, not yesterday or the day before. What he's given today is for all of us. Those 7,000 photographs to be donated to History Colorado where anyone can freely browse or download. You know, I never felt that I owned my photos. I felt that was kind of selfish and how could anybody, kind of like white people thinking that they own a particular piece of real estate for generations to come, whereas Native Americans think they're just leaseholders. They're just there on a temporary basis. On that ridge of 12,000 feet. When I visited John, we sat on his back patio facing the mountains. Last night was probably the most sublime, most beautiful spring in Colorado moment I've ever seen. And it happened from my patio. And Barry, I give you full credit for the fact that you were gonna come up the next day and I wanted you to see 
what you were getting into and find out if you could handle the pressure of being in the most beautiful place on earth under the most beautiful condition of light at least 24 hours after that. I give you credit for not stopping and still photographing. Thank you very much. Uh, there's always photos to be taken. Couldn't resist, could you? I've never have been able to resist. To which anyone who loves nature, who loves its beauty, who loves its changing seasons, can only say, thank you, John Fielder. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.